dynamics, geometry, and moduli space agreement surfaces. Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak here today. Uh, so I'll start at the very beginning. Uh, this talk is about Riemann surfaces, uh, which are surfaces with the lattice of turns to C, so the transition functions are by all programs. And typically I'll have in mind a closed surface, often of genus at least two, but sometimes genus one. Uh, one of the things that makes Riemann surfaces really interesting is that there are several really different perspectives and several really different ways to talk about Riemann surfaces. So, uh, for example, you can specify Riemann surfaces as smooth algebraic curves using polynomial equations. Uh, you can also specify them using subgroups of PSL2R in most cases, um, uh, because PSL2R is the group of bihomorphisms of the disk. So the, the, the group of deck transformations of the universal cover uh, gives you a subgroup of PSL2R. And of course, one of the most important miracles in low dimensional topology and geometry is that the group of biholomorphisms is the same as the group of isometries. So every uh, Riemann surface of genus at least two is obtained in this way and has a unique hyperbolic metric. Uh, and uh, most importantly for this talk, you can specify a surface using polygons. So this is something I imagine many of you will have seen in, in some form. So for example, if you take the octagon and identify opposite edges, you get a genus two surface. And you may be familiar with this from, you know, maybe one of your classes proved the classification of surfaces. Um, but I, I don't just want to think about this topologically. I also want to think about this as a metric object. Uh, and the surface inherits a metric from the plane. And like all metrics, it's given by a two tensor, which in this case is dz squared, where z is x plus i y. Um, <laughs> there is a singularity to the metric. Uh, all eight corners of the surface are identified. And at that point, there's six pi cone angle. Okay, so this, uh, this, this dz squared is what we call a holomorphic quadratic differential. So uh, because this surface comes from a subset of the complex plane, and of course the complex plane is a complex structure, uh, you can show uh, this is not just a metric surface, but also a Riemann surface. And this, this uh, differential is a, is a holomorphic quadratic differential. So it turns out to have a zero at the singularity, although it takes some effort to think through what happens at the singularity. So if you haven't seen it, you'll have to just trust me. Um, and uh, so you can get all Riemann surfaces in this way, and you can get each Riemann surface in many different ways. Um, so one obvious thing is you could sort of cut this polygon in half and re-glue it or translate it somewhere else in the complex plane, and you obviously still get the same quadratic differential on the same Riemann surface. Uh, but also, there are many quadratic differentials on each Riemann surface. There's a whole vector space of them. Um, and it's one of the, the foundational facts in the area that all of them can be realized by polygons in this way. Okay, so a polygonal presentation of a Riemann surface is equivalent to a, a choice of non-zero quadratic differential. Um, and you can see already there are many Riemann surfaces of the same genus. Uh, and in fact, the space of all Riemann surfaces of the same genus, the so-called moduli space, uh, is, a, is a manifold, or rather an orbifold of complex dimension 3G minus 3. Um, and uh, this, this moduli space mg, it's also the moduli space of smooth algebraic curves over the complex numbers. And when genus is at least two, uh, it's the moduli space of hyperbolic metrics on a surface of genus g. Uh, so you can imagine this is important in many different areas. Um, uh, it is itself an algebraic variety, and since it also parameterizes the smallest dimensional algebraic varieties, it's a fundamental object in algebraic geometry. Um, it has a, a Kähler uh, uh, structure, so you can study it from the point of view of symplectic geometry. Um, uh, it's uh, orbifold fundamental, which is the mapping class group, so it's you know, one of the most important uh, objects in low dimensional topology. Its universal cover is Teichmuller space, the fundamental object in Teichmuller theory. Um, uh, but today I want to think about it as a, I want to start off by thinking about it as a metric space. Okay? And the, the philosophy here is that this is just such an important object, we want to understand it really well. Um, so uh, the, the metric I want to talk about is called the Teichmuller metric. It's not the Kähler metric I was just referring to, it's a different metric. Um, uh, 
And like all metrics, it, it is an answer to the question, how far apart are two different points? And since the points in moduli space represent Riemann surfaces, it means you're asking how different are two different Riemann surfaces. And the answer that the Teichmuller metric provides is that of you know, classical complex analysis, like your first course in complex analysis. Um, so first of all, if the distance between two Riemann surfaces is zero, that just means there's a conformal map between them. So a map that preserves angles or takes infinitesimal circles to infinitesimal circles. Uh, so if you have two truly different Riemann surfaces, there's no conformal map, but there are many, many diffeomorphisms between the Riemann surfaces. And I want to start off by thinking about the question of, okay, if I have a diffeomorphism, how close is it to being conformal? I think that's a sort of natural point of view. Um, and there's a very natural and easy way to think about that. Okay, so back to infinitesimal circles. So what I mean by infinitesimal circles is I want to fix a point on um, the, the Riemann surface and look at its tangent space. So an infinitesimal circle is a circle in the tangent space. Now the derivative of the diffeomorphism maps uh, that tangent space to another tangent space. Uh, and the circle gets mapped to an ellipse. It's, you know, any uh, map between two-dimensional spaces that's linear takes circles to ellipses. And there's a very obvious way of measuring the failure of an ellipse to be a circle. Right? So if this was conformal, if it preserved angles, that second ellipse would actually be a circle. If it's not, you can look at the ratio of its major axis to its minor axis. And the bigger that is, the less conformal if it was conformal, that would have been one. And you can define what's called the dilatation of the map uh, just to be the max of that ratio. Okay, so it's a quantitative measure um, of how far you are from being conformal. And if you were conformal, that number would be one. Uh, so to get the Teichmuller metric then, you just look at the inf over all differential maps of the dilatation. But you should remember the dilatation is one if it's conformal. So you should take log of dilatation. And that will mean the distance from a point to itself is zero. And it will also let you check the triangle inequality. Um, so it's not really clear from this definition because it involves an inf. But this is a really nice metric. Um, and it is, it's what's called the Finzler metric, uh, which is a, a cousin of a Ramanian metric. So in a Ramanian metric, if you want to know the distance between two points, you look at the inf over all paths and you integrate the length of the tangent vector. Uh, so it's the same in a Finzler metric, except the length of a tangent vector is computed from a norm that doesn't necessarily arise from a unit product. Okay, so the difference between Ramanian and Finzler is the difference between inner products and general norms. Uh, and uh, this metric has wonderful properties. So there's a, if you go to the universal cover, Teichmuller space, there's a unique geodesic through every pair of points. So as many of you know, that's a property of negatively curved spaces. However, Teichmuller space hasn't been negatively curved in my lifetime. Uh, it was briefly negatively curved until a mistake was found in the proof. And ultimately, Howie Mazur came up with a very compelling counterexample. He found a pair of geodesic rays leaving the same point that stay bounded distance apart. So it's not, you know, whatever you mean by negative curvature, it's not negatively curved or even non-positively curved, although it does uh, behave many of the it does have many of the properties of a, of a negatively curved space. Um, but anyways, what's more wonderful is that I can actually tell you what the geodesics are, which is a rare thing in nature to actually know geodesics explicitly. Um, and you can get all the geodesics through x by presenting x using polygons, like I did before, um, and uh, just acting on those polygons by the, the one parameter family of matrices, e to the t, 0, 0, e to the minus t. So it's stretching out the polygons. So that'll give you a one parameter family of Riemann surfaces, which is the most efficient way of getting from one to the other. Okay, and remember, for each quadratic differential on x, and there are lots, there's a polygonal presentation. So that's how you get all the different geodesics through x, by varying the quadratic differential. So let me give you an example. So here's the flat torus you should identify opposite sides. And I'll act by, by G1, so E0, 0, E inverse. So that stretches it out, and I get this surface. And you can imagine interpolating, and that would give you the geodesic. So these pair of points are exactly one apart um, for the type of uh, Now, one thing I want to emphasize is these polygonal pictures are optic cut and paste. 
Right? I can take this and I can cut off this triangle and take this triangle and move it on top. And this is the same Riemann surface with the same quadratic differential. Um, and I say this to avoid a misconception. You might think you act by g1 million, so that you know really smushes out your picture. Um, and so you have a very degenerate sort of collection of polygons. You may think the surface is degenerate. But that's not at all true. You might be able to cut up those polygons and reassemble them into a much more reasonable picture. So in fact, typically when you apply gt to the surface, I mean, it might degenerate, but typically it doesn't. Um, and a lot of what makes the field difficult is we don't really have any sort of combinatorial understanding of this cut and paste, um, maybe except for the case of the torus. OK. So um, let's just have a little summary before I move to a different question. So uh, for every quadratic differential, I can act by these matrices GT and get a G. So in other words, I get a, an, an action of R via these matrices on the bundle of non-zero quadratic differentials over modulus. So that's a vector bundle. Um, uh, and as I said, the orbits of this uh, project to 2v6. So you should compare this to uh, the geodesic flow on the tangent bundle of a manifold. And that's a great comparison, although technically, the bundle of quadratic differentials is the cotangent bundle, not the tangent bundle, which is something that confuses a lot of people when they first learn. I was just expressing my question about that. So it is the cotangent bundle, so why should we get the geodesic flow on it rather than on the tangent bundle? Um, let me just defer that question, because okay. it's, it's, it's a bit confusing. Okay. Um, there's some sort of duality. Uh, um, okay. Uh, so now I'm going to move, are there any other questions? I swear I am willing to answer most questions. <laughs> just not, 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 not Dennis's. Well. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so uh, now, okay, so I, I told you, you know, moduli space is a fundamental object. We want to understand it as a metric object with this type moment metric. And that leads us to the action of two by two matrices on the bundle of quadratic differentials. So now I want to just start over and. Uh, Wait, I missed that. How did you get that? Oh, you went back to the torus? Um, well, how did you get it? Oh, so I said so far, I, I started with trying to understand the geometry of MG. Right. And I got <coughs> to the action of some 2 by 2 matrices on the bundle of quadratic differentials. So this is acting on the quadratic differentials as a real vector bundle, right? Yeah. yeah. This is a very, you should think of it as a sort of a transcendental action. It doesn't, I mean, you can analyze this from many points of view, but it doesn't in any of the most straightforward ways preserve the algebraic structure or the complex structure or anything like that. And the answer to Dennis's question about the geodesic flow is that the geodesic flow is natural on the cotangent bundle for Fenthlin metric because it's, it's built out of a symplectic operation, right? So if you, if you then want to transfer that over to the tangent bundle, it's actually by a, a complicated uh, duality argument. Right. Um, OK, so now I want to start over with a different motivation that's going to seem you know, totally in left field, but we're going to get to exactly the same point. And it's one of the historical motivations. Uh, so it's a, it's a toy problem in physics. And it's the, the problem of polygonal billions. So you have a polygon. You're the square, and you bounce a ball around. And it goes forever. But it's a corner. OK, it stops. But actually, if you start at a point and sort of go off in a random direction, it'll never hit a corner. It's a zero probability event, so you shouldn't be too worried about that anyways. And uh, the perspective is that of dynamics. So you're interested in what happens in the long run. Uh, are there periodic orbits? Um, just paths that repeat themselves. Uh, that sort of question. Um, so unfortunately, this is a very different, difficult question. And making general statements about uh, <coughs> polygonal billiards that are valid for all polygons uh, is on the list of the, on Kotak's list of the five most resilient problems in dynamics. Uh, and it's a problem that's very difficult to connect to, you know, the machinery of mathematics. Uh, there is, however, a trick which works in some cases and uh, spectacularly connects the problem to other mathematics. Uh, I've been told that the trick has appeared several times on the Putnam, although I haven't checked. Um, anyways, it's, a, it's a really a very intuitive trick. So say you're trying to do billiards in this polygon. And you have a billiard path, and it sort of goes here and it bounces off here. So the idea is, instead of bouncing this, you 
unfold the polygon or reflect it to obtain a second copy of the polygon. So you just imagine you have two and you unfold it. Um, and then you allow the, the billiard ball to continue straight. And there's an easy observation, which is that the straight line continuation is the reflection or unfolding of the billiard continuation. So if you unfold, your billiard trajectory will unfold to a straight line. Shouldn't straight lines be easier? Um, uh, so let me illustrate this in an example. So this is the right angle triangle with smallest angle pi over 8. So I'm going to unfold. And what's crucial is I'm going to look for an excuse to stop unfolding. So I want to do this without thinking about one billiard path in particular, but sort of have it work for all billiard paths. And I want it to end. I want to have some excuse to terminate the process. Um, so I'll start by unfolding it with the hypotenuse. And then I'll unfold again. And you see where this is going. I get the, the uh, eight gone, the regular eight gone. <clears throat> and then, OK, so I should unfold my starting triangle about this edge. But I want an excuse to stop, and I'm going to claim that I have one. Because I would get this triangle, but I already have that triangle. It's over here. So if I'm just willing to identify this edge with this edge, then I do have the reflection of this triangle above that edge. Okay, so likewise, I can identify all the opposite sides and get at the same Riemann surface with quadratic differential I started with that's totally unfolded. Okay, so now instead of studying billiard trajectories, on the, on the triangle, I can study straight lines on this octagon surface. OK, so the bad news is this is a trick and it doesn't always work. Okay, so if you want to study you know, arbitrary polygons, I don't have much to say. Uh, this, it's, it's easy to check this works if and only if all the angles are rational multiples of pi. If you have one irrational multiple of pi, you just keep unfolding and it goes on forever. So it does give you some sort of infinite genus surface, but we don't, we haven't really been successful in, in using that very much. Um, uh, but we're happy because it gives us something, namely a Riemann surface with a quadratic differential that we cared about anyways. Um, and uh, you actually, you can see that it's sufficient. Rational multiply makes it sufficient. Yeah, although it'll be easier if I tell you a formal definition. So here's a formal definition of the unfolding. Look at the subgroup of O2, so group of two by two matrices. Look at the subgroup of O2 generated by derivatives of the reflections in the edges of your polygon. For each uh, element of that subgroup, take a copy of your polygon and then identify edges if they differ by a reflection. Um, so that's the that's sort of formal definition of the unfolding. So now you just need to check that this subgroup of O2 you get is finite if and only if all the angles are rational. And already, if you have one irrational angle, just looking at those two reflections will give you an infinite order uh, rotation. OK. Um, so we, we get a Riemann surface with a quadratic differential. Uh, and actually, we even care about the same uh, matrix uh, GT, which was We even care about the same action on quadratic differentials, because Maybe you unfold a billiard trajectory to a straight line, and you rotate it so it's, it's vertical. If you act by this matrix, you'll get a shorter vertical trajectory on a new quadratic differential, which is to say that this renormalizes the straight line flow. Um, so for dynamical reasons, you end up studying the same thing. Uh, but more than that, you, you don't just have to act by diagonal matrices. You can act by any 2 by 2 you have a quadratic differential, you present it using polygons, you act on those polygons linearly in the same way R2, GL2R always acts on R2. Um, and uh, this turns out to be a very complicated action. So the, one of the first things I can tell you is that uh, in the 80s, Mazur and Beach showed independently that almost every surface has dense orbit, which I think is, is pretty amazing. You know, I pick a generic surface, and you pick a very special surface. Maybe yours is very symmetric. Maybe it's very degenerate. I don't know. But with what's essentially an affine change of coordinates, just this GL2R, I can make my surface look arbitrarily close to yours. So that's, again, something we don't have any elementary proof of that's proven using ergodic theory. And the form in which they proved it, they showed something stronger. They showed that the technology doesn't flow for MG is ergodic. 
with a stronger dynamical statement. Okay, so as I said, um, the action by a two by two matrix is sort of just an affine coordinate change. It, you know, you can always undo it by acting by the inverse matrix. It's sort of just a different perspective on the same surface. You, know, you act by this matrix, things that were long and vertical are now easier to spot because they're shorter. Um, so if you want to understand the surface as well as possible, you want to understand from every possible perspective, that means you should try to understand its orbit. So that's true, we do want to understand the orbit. It turns out it's easier to understand the orbit closure. Why? Well, a naive reason is almost every surface has the same orbit closure, which is the whole space. So even naively, there are less orbit closures than there are orbits. So that naively, you sort of see a little bit of an indication it might be easier to study. Okay, so um, I'll tell you more history and context in a second, but now I can already tell you the, the, talk, the question that this talk addresses. Um, and the question is, can we classify orbit closures? Um, and can we compute them? Say for one of these unfoldings of a polygonal billiard table. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you more about that later. We can't classify them yet, although we can do a lot. Uh, uh, but also, I hope in this talk to convince you that the orbit closures are intrinsically interesting loci. Okay, a bit of history. Uh, so, Beach in the late 80s, uh, while thinking about a question of Gromov, uh, found that some unfoldings of triangles have closed yield to our orbit. So this is highly non-generic behavior. The generic point is dense yield to our orbit. So this is the smallest the orbit can be as the orbit closure can be. Um, and from this, he developed some, uh, some interesting corollaries, some in interesting consequences. So one was he was able to understand the billiard uh, in some of these triangles very well. For example, showing unique or um, uh, He also found some weird and unexpected things that I think can help you understand how special it is to have a closed orbit. Uh, and to illustrate that, let's just think about the right angle triangle with smallest angle pi over 5. So um, being a rational polygon, we know that there are infinitely many periodic failure trajectories. By the way, we don't even know that for irrational triangles. Um, but there are infinitely many periodic failure trajectories. And you could list their lengths. And if you do that, what Beach found was that um, they come in pairs, one golden ratio times bigger than so for every periodic billiard trajectory, there's another one which is either golden ratio times bigger or golden ratio times smaller. They come in pairs. Um, and uh, to this day, the only known proof of that involves computing the orbit closure and doing some hyperbolic geometry and dynamics uh, to get this. Okay, there's no combinatorial proof. OK, so I don't know what you're supposed to think of that. That's sort of a weird fact. But I think it's surprising, and it can help you understand that this is somehow an unexpected object. Um, uh, Beach also uh, thought about the consequences of this for the Teichmuller geometry of energy. So just to have a little general discussion here. GL2 orbits are four real dimensional, because a 2 by 2 matrix has four entries. But GL2 includes rotations and scalings, which are conformal. So the GL2 orbit lives in the bundle of quadratic differentials. But if you project it to mg, you lose two real dimensions coming from rotations and scaling. So you, you project to mg, and you get something two real dimensional. It turns out it's one complex dimensional. Uh, and Veach found that when you uh, project a closed GL2 orbit to mg, you get an, an algebraic curve. So it's something complex dimension one and closed. Uh, and it turns out it's isometrically immersed with respect to the hyperbolic metric on this complex algebraic curve on the smooth surface, and the Teichmuller metric in mg. So he found some piece of the Teichmuller geometry of mg, which was interesting, but somehow much simpler than the rest of the geometry. Is this just for the closed orbits? Uh, it's just for the closed orbits that you get an algebraic curve. For any orbit, you get an, an uh, isometric map from hyperbolic space. So the surprising thing about closed orbits is it somehow wraps around itself um, to close up. Other questions? What's the translation of this statement to the modular space? Do you have any equivalent uh, translation? 
for this billiard uh, trajectory statement, did you have something about geodesics in modular space? Uh, no, it's not about modular space. It's about the quadratic differentials. Oh, okay. So these quadratic differentials, um, uh, in the direction of any saddle connection, the quadratic differential can decomposes into two cylinders, one voltage ratio times bigger than the other. So that, the, that exact statement is specific to this example, but the general form of that statement is, is, is uh, applies to all closed GL2 orbits. Other questions? Okay, uh, let's continue. So I'm going to jump forward. You see, this was in 89. I'm going to jump forward to 2003. In the meantime, very few orbit closures were found. I think uh, two. Two closed orbits, both uh, coming from triangles. Um, uh, so in 2003, uh, Kalta and McMullen in independently found infinitely many new interesting orbit closures in genus 2. Uh, so infinitely many new closed orbits and infinitely many orbit closures which were intermediate. They weren't closed, but also the orbit closure wasn't the whole space. The orbit wasn't dense. Um, and uh, McMullen's point of view revealed that these orbit closures are actually algebraic varieties that are closely related to Hilbert modulus. So the, the point being here that they're, they're objects that were of interest beforehand for totally orthogonal reasons. Uh, and McMullen was able to make a classification of genus uh, But as of about five years ago, uh, again, not a lot of additional orbit closures have been found to jump forward another decade. Um, and uh, furthermore, all the orbit closures were of one of two types. So on the one hand, almost every orbit is dense. So that means the whole moduli space is an orbit closure. Right? And there's a way of disguising that counterexample, that orbit closure, and making it look slightly less trivial. So namely, you could take, say, all genus 2 quadratic differentials, and then look at all degree 13 covers of those Riemann surfaces. And then so you'd get a, a locus of quadratic differentials in genus whatever. And that, that turns out to be easily seen to be closed in GL2 R invariant, and hence a GL2 R orbit closure. But it's somehow really just a copy of what was going on in genus 2, plus a little bit of combinatorics for the cover. So I'll call that a trivial orbit closure. So one that's a whole space or coming from the whole space via some transparent covering construction. Um, on the other hand, you had closed orbits, and you had orbits that, while not technically closed, had very, very similar properties to closed orbits. So here I just wrote cousins of closed orbits, although I can tell you the technical definition if you want. Um, but we sort of had this gap, right? We had the really big orbit closures that were a whole space, and the other ones that really looked like closed orbits. Are these closed, closed, or are they with punctures? Um, they're not compact. Yeah, OK. Um, OK, and furthermore, not only did we not know many orbit closures, but we also couldn't compute the orbit closure any explicit example, even if you know, we thought it might be dense, but we, we couldn't compute it. And this was especially unsatisfactory when it came to rational billiards, because a lot of people had been you know, developing technology, saying that part of the motivation was to apply to rational billiards. But to get the most out of that technology, sometimes to get anything from it at all, you need to know the orbit closure. The typical situation is you have some question about a quadratic differential. Um, if you have two quadratic differentials with the same orbit closure, the answer will be the same. And if they have different orbit closures, typically the answer will be different. Uh, okay. So then uh, uh, a big event happened. So there was a big theorem of Eskin Mirzakhani and a second paper by Eskin Mirzakhani Mohammadi. And this is one of the results for which Mirzakhani won the Fields Medal. Um, uh, they showed that GL2 orbit closures are always known. Or if you want to be really thick, you properly immersed smooth several um, uh, uh Which is a really amazing theorem, right? This is dynamics. And dynamics, you know, orbit closures are fractals. Uh, but somehow here, the orbit closures are very nice. Uh, and not only are they manifolds, but they're even manifolds locally cut out by linear equations, which is something best illustrated by example. Uh, so the, the easiest example of an orbit closure um, comes from thinking about this uh, genus 2 surface, where you should identify the perpendicularly opposite edges. 
Um, by the way, you should never try to visualize this as a surface. If you want to know its genus, compute its Euler characteristic. Vertices minus spaces plus edges. It won't help you to do the mental gymnastics to try to see it as a closed surface in R3. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, as I said, I want to think about this uh, genus 2 surface that's a fourfold cover of a torus. You can say what happens when you act by GL2R. Well, you get a fourfold cover of a different torus. And you can use this to very easily convince yourself that this locus of fourfold covers of a torus is a single GL2R orbit and is hence closed. Okay, so this surface has closed orbit. Uh, so to point the bazooka that is Eskimir Zakani Mohammadi at it, that means that it must, being an orbit closure, it must be cut out by linear equations. So let's see the linear equations. Here they are. So first of all, if this covers the torus, then actually this edge and this edge will map to the same circle on the torus. So that means they have to have the same length. And what do I mean by length? Um, so each edge gives you a vector in R2. And R2, I actually don't like R2, let's just say the complex plane. So R2 is isomorphic to the complex plane. So each edge has some complex length. And, and these equations are equations on the, the complex lengths of the edges. Um, uh, so as I said, these two map to the same circle and so have to be the same and similarly derive these equations. And these equations locally cut out this closed orbit in the modulus. So when you say this is cover of the, of the torus, it's, it's a ramified cover? It's, with yeah, ramified over one point. One point on the torus, two points on the genus two surface. Uh, okay. Um, so, uh, how is it that Eskimir Zakani Mohammadi uh, thought to try to prove this theorem? Well, uh, moduli space of Riemann surfaces is actually a very inhomogeneous object. If you put me down on moduli space, and I had a very weak flashlight, so I could only see essentially only my feet, maybe like one inch around them, I could tell you exactly where I was in moduli space. Because each area of moduli space is uniquely bumpy. So its metric structure is unique. It doesn't look the same in any two places. Um, which is to say, moduli space is as inhomogeneous as possible. But nonetheless, uh, the mathematical community has learned that it's very helpful to compare it to homogeneous spaces, so spaces with transitive group actions. Spaces like uh, SL3R mod SL3C, G mod gamma for some lead group and some class. Um, and in this context, uh, there are some theorems often called Ratner's theorems, that here I'll illustrate in a special case previously known to Daniel Margulis. So I want to stick to SL3R mod SL3Z for and I want to think about this one parameter unipotent subgroup. So this uh, subgroup acts on G mod gamma just by multiplication on whichever side you didn't mod out by gamma. Uh, and uh, these people showed that every orbit closure for this action is manifold. So this is a very important theorem all over math because Lie groups arise as symmetry groups all over math. So if you have a, you know, some sort of Lie group arising, sometimes you can use this to understand the symmetries of some object that you're studying. Uh, so Eskin, Rizakani, and Mohamadi were trying to prove some analog of this uh, for modulus space, uh, for the bundle of quadratic differentials. OK. So um, so far in this talk, I've given you two motivations for studying the GL to our action on the bundle of quadratic differentials. One, understand the Teichmuller metric on, this, on MG. And two, understand rational billiards. Um, and I've, I've given you a little bit of history uh, culminating this result of, of Eskin, Rizokani, Mohammadi. And I've told you what the main problem is for me, which is classify the orbit. So Eskin, Mirzakhani, Mohamadi gives us hope. The orbit closures are nice things. They also show there are most countably many. So you can actually hope to make a literal list of them all. Um, uh, but unfortunately, Eskin, Mirzakhani, Mohamadi doesn't say what they are. It's, the proof is 300 pages of extremely abstract mathematics. And at the end, what you know is that they're linear manifolds, and not a lot else. 
so, so in the rest of the talk, I want to tell you um, three results I've proven in the direction of trying to be able to compute orbit closures and classify orbit closures. So the first one I'll mention, which is joint with Mirzakhani, is that we can finally compute some unfoldings, some orbit closures of unfoldings. And the unfoldings uh, that Mirzakhani and I focused on are that of triangles. And we showed there are infinitely many triangles that unfold to surfaces with dense orbit. Um, and we were excited about this for uh, a few reasons. Um, one of them is that in each genus, there are only finitely many surfaces that arise in this way. And they really, from every different perspective, look like they want to have closed orbit. Okay, they're very special, very symmetric surfaces. They look like they want to have closed orbit. And despite that, very often they have dense orbit. Uh, so this is an indication that there aren't that many orbit closures, um, which will be the moral of a lot of the things I say. There, there are many indications there aren't many orbit closures. Um, and our, our methods are effective. All of these triangles have dense orbit, and the list goes on forever. So I said there aren't many orbit closures, but um, uh, one of the most exciting things I can tell you today is we have found some new ones that uh, buck the trend of, of previously known orbit closures. Uh, so in joint work with, with Kurt McMullen, Ronan Mukamel, and then later also with Alex Eskin, um, we uh, showed that all quadrilaterals with one of these six angle types, and I'll show you a picture, picture in a second, unfold to surfaces with very special orbit closure. And so the one I put in red is the one that's just joint with uh, McMullen and Mukamel. Uh, and I wanted to spend the next five minutes telling you what does very special mean, because I have a few things in mind. Okay, so first of all, let me consider the, the case that's pi over five, pi over five, pi over five, and seven pi over five. They all look sort of like this in terms of pictures. Um, so as before, there are infinitely many periodic billiard trajectories. These aren't actually periodic, but they're trajectories that start and end at this point, and that's extremely close to the just was easier to draw these. Alex Eskin made this picture. Um, so what uh, we're sure is true, and we'll be able to prove, I think, when we get around to it, is that again, these billiard trajectories come in pairs, one golden ratio times bigger than the other. Um, and this is even more surprising than before, I think, because um, before there was an example of this with a triangle, but there's only one triangle with given angles. But with quadrilaterals, um, there are many quadrilaterals with the same angles. You can vary the lengths keeping the angles the same. And as you do that variation, uh, it just wrecks havoc on the set of periodic billiard trajectories. And despite that chaos, you know, billiard trajectories are created and destroyed, this pattern persists. Again, this is, again, I'm not sure what you're supposed to think of this, except that it's maybe supposed to help you understand that these are, are pretty weird objects. Uh, and by the way, I should say, we think these are probably the only six angle types. There's, there's some evidence in that direction. So these six types of quadrilaterals among all quadrilaterals seem to be the most special. Um, so to tell you the next uh, uh, surprise that came along with the discovery of these orbit closures, I want to move to slightly more general moduli spaces. Namely, MGN, the moduli space of genus G surfaces with N marked um, and I'll say that a complex submanifold of MGN is totally geodesic if it contains a geodesic between any pair of its points. So these are the direct higher dimensional generalizations of type one curves, isometrically immersed algebraic curves that I mentioned earlier. Um, and we found the first known non-trivial examples. So we found totally geodesic complex surfaces in M13, M14, and M21. Um, uh, so you can also think about these in Teichmuller spaces, where they seem, you can think of them as some sort of exotic Teichmuller space. Also, your result is a geodesic or all the geodesics? Do uh, you think about complex? Uh, it's, it's easier to phrase the definition in Teichmuller space, in which case it, is, it contains the geodesic. But complex geodesic? Yeah, the complex geodesic. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's actually equivalent to the real geodesic once you know it's a complex submanifold, but um, yeah, it contains the whole complex geodesic. 
Other questions? So although these are the direct higher dimensional generalization of Tegenloy curves, I think they're interesting for very different reasons. These guys are much more rare and rigid. And although, again, there's sort of a smaller piece of the geometry of MG that you know, might be easier to understand, here these actually, I think, capture many of the interesting features of the geometry in a way Tegenloy curves didn't. Because Tegenloy curves, the metric is just hyperbolic. Where here the metric is actually genuinely some you know, complicated piece of the Finsler geometry. Um, and, and somehow, I don't have time to tell you about the construction of these, but they all have very nice algebraic geometry. And are these modular spaces like uh, uh, projective varieties and they're major complex submanifolds, so they would also be Taylor manifolds and all that? Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And yet, for this, uh, for this metric, they're geodesic. Yeah. But not for, say, the Vapiers metric. So these don't, uh, don't arise as fixed point sets of anything? Uh, not that's known. I, I can't tell you definitively that's an interesting I mean, if, I was, if, if, if they were, then they would, in fact, also be totally geodesic for any invariant metric. That's true, yeah. So they definitely don't. Uh, and I can, yeah, if you ask me later, I wrote a, a follow-up paper on my own, uh, sort of giving more of the general theory of, of higher dimensional complex submanifold type of space. And they really behave in the opposite way from the one complex dimensional case, which is that of type of disks. Uh, so those were both surprises that I told you that indicate maybe something about why these new orbit closures are special. Um, but the real reason that I personally was studying them uh, is that they turned out all to be counterexamples to a conjecture Mirzakhani had that all orbit closures are either trivial or have properties in common with closed orbits. Um, and so I was trying to prove Mirzakhani's conjectures with Mirzakhani uh, when I discovered the first sort of of these orbit closures in a conjectural form. But as I'll comment in a minute, it was very hard to prove that there actually was an orbit closure, even once we believed it there, and even once we thought we had a picture of it. Um, uh, so um, I'm, in a sense, sad that Mirzakhani's conjecture is true, because it would have been sort of 95% of a classification of orbit closures. Uh, and sort of one swoop would have just really you know, cleared a big part of the field. Um, and there's no conjecture to replace it, but I think it's actually still a very good idea to try to prove that it's true, even though it's actually false. So it's, you just need to show it's mostly true, and we're still figuring out exactly what that means. Um, so we have eight counterexamples, two I didn't tell you about, that arise from one of these in a sort of straightforward opening up way. Um, uh, with, with Alex Eskin and Simeon Phillip, uh, I showed that there are only finally many counterexamples in each genus. And I proved something stronger, which is that there are only finally many things that are even candidate counterexamples. There are only finally many things that are not cousins of closed orbits. Um, and uh, uh, Alex Simeon and I also have finding this results for all orbit closures, even the ones that are uh, closed orbits or, or cousins of closed orbits. Um, and there the result is not just finiteness. Um, but the results have a form that you see many other places in math, which is that if you have infinitely many surprising objects, really the reason you have them is you, there's actually one bigger, even more surprising object. And if you know about the bigger, even more surprising object, it made it obvious that all these little surprises were there. You somehow only have finally many true surprises in life. Um, OK, so uh, I've now told you about three results. We can compute some orbit closures of unfoldings, and we focused on triangles. We have new orbit closures, which are counterexamples to the only conjecture we had. Um, and these arose from quadrilaterals. Uh, and uh, we have finding this result saying, really, there are not many orbit closures out there. They're very rare objects. Uh, and in the remaining time, I want to tell you a little bit about the proofs. And to tell you about the proofs, the first thing I want to do is get rid of the quadratic difference. So um, a quadratic differential looks like a holomorphic function times dz squared. And it's helpful to take a square root of the quadratic differential. So you can't always do that, but you can do it if you're willing to pass to a double cover, which is a very common thing in, in math. 
Why take a square root, pass to a double cover. Um, so if you go to a double cover, the quadratic differential will become the square of a holomorphic one form. Something that's a holomorphic function times dz of local coordinates. Uh, and these holomorphic one forms are also called abelian differentials. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about quadratic differentials anymore. I'm just going to talk about abelian differentials. Um, and I should say now that every time I said genus earlier, like when I talked about McMullen's work in genus 2, I meant the genus of the abelian differential. Okay, so um, if you present the, polygon, the surface using polygons, the flat metric was given by dz squared. That was the quadratic differential. So the abelian differential, or the holomorphic one form, is obviously then just dz. Um, uh, and the, the zeros of this one form correspond to the corners of the polygon, or the cone angle, the cone singularities of the surface. Um, now, what was implicit when I told you about the, the linear equations defining orbit closures was that the complex lengths of the polygon's edges are local coordinates of the moduli space. Um, and now let me tell you a different way to think about these local coordinates. So if I have a line segment in C, and I want its complex length, a sort of pretentious way to find that complex length is to say, oh, I have this abelian differential on, on C, which is just dz. And I have a relative homology class. So there's a class in the homology of the complex plane mod these two points, which is just this line. And I'll integrate this relative, I'll integrate this abelian differential over this relative homology. Okay, so uh, really, these edge lengths are periods. They're integrals of the, the one form. Um, uh, and they come in two flavors um, that I'll draw for you now. So uh, think that these come from edges of the polygon. It may be that the two corners are identified on the surface, like was the case when we thought about the regular octopus. Right, but all the corners were identified at the same point. So then each edge gives you a loop on the surface, a closed loop, or in other words, an absolute homology class. But it might also be that the two uh, corners on this edge don't get identified to a single point. Uh, so then you get a relative homology class, so class of the, the homology of the surface relative to the finite set of, of cone points. Okay, so Eskin Mirzakani Mohammadi says if there's an orbit closure, it's cut out by linear equations on these periods. So you should ask then, are there natural and important examples of Riemann surfaces with abelian differentials where the periods satisfy linear equations? Um, and the answer is yes, there are important and natural examples. Uh, and they all involve the Jacobian of the Riemann surface which is some sort of higher dimensional complex torus that encodes all the information of the Riemann surface. And uh, these linear equations arise in one of two ways. So Riemann surfaces, higher genus Riemann surfaces suck at being symmetric. They have finite symmetry groups. But these Jacobians are complex tori that are very symmetric and have lots of interesting self maps. So maybe the Jacobian has some sort of endomorphism, some sort of self-map. So I won't give you the full definition, but in particular, that means that there's a map uh, that induces a map from the first homology of the surface to itself. Okay. That map also acts on the space of abelian differentials. And maybe your chosen abelian differential is an eigenvector for that action, for that linear transformation. So in that case, what happens is that if you integrate the abelian differential over the endomorphism applied to the homology class, you get the eigenvalue times the original uh, integral. Okay, so eigenforms for endomorphisms of the Jacobian get, have um, lots of interesting linear equations that hold on their periods. And somehow this endomorphism you should think of as representing some sort of hidden symmetry of the Riemann surface. Symmetry of its periods that might actually not come from symmetry of the Riemann surface. Um, so uh, this gives you equations exclusively on absolute homology. Okay, there, there no, it's not rel or anything. Um, to get equations on relative homology, you need to think of something called torsion. Um, and uh, we'll be thinking about when 
two zeros of the abelian differential are torsion and Jacobian. Um, so again, I won't tell you the full definition, but um, uh, a consequence of the definition, actually this is the full definition if you use all holomorphic forms, is that if you take a path joining the two zeros and you look at its periods, then actually all of those periods are given by periods of a relative, oh, of an absolute homology class. <laughs> okay, so the point is, uh, if two zeros are torsion and Jacobian, there are linear equations that relate relative periods to absolute periods. Uh, so McMullen, when he found uh, the orbit closures in genus two, really what he discovered is that the, the locus of eigenforms for a particular type of endomorphism is GL to R invariant in genus two. So it gives closed GL to R invariant sets, which are orbit closures. Um, uh, in the same paper, McMullen definitively proved this was not true in higher genus. In higher genus, locus of eigenforms are simply not invariant. What he found is some sort of miracle of linear algebra in small dimensions that caused this to be true. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Mola showed that if you have a closed orbit, all of the linear equations actually do come from these special properties of the Jacobian. So there's a lot of tension here. Okay? On the one hand, there's no reason in higher genus for these conditions on the Jacobian to give something GL to R invariant. On the other hand, if you have something GL to R invariant, then actually it's cut out by these conditions. Okay? So the, there is tension there, and again, it's an indication there aren't many orbit closures. Um, and then uh, later, Philip greatly generalized this to show that it's true for all orbit closures. Okay, and in particular, it followed that since orbit closures are cut out by algebraic conditions on the Jacobian, that they're algebraic varieties, which wasn't known beforehand. Um, okay, so I want to say just a word about how to build orbit closures. Um, and it's actually interesting. If you're you know, an algebraic genre, you like to play with special families of Riemann surfaces, you can try. You don't have to know a lot of theory. So you don't think about the GL tour action. You're trying to build some sort of variety that's cut out locally by linear equations. So how do you do that? Well, it's, it's in a sense, easy. Um, you have some d-dimensional subvariety, and you try to show that it's contained in a d-dimensional linear subspace. And if that's true, then it must be linear. And so it sort of boils down to a dimension count. You build a big family where the Jacobian is special. You say, my family is however many dimensional. And then you say, oh, because my family is special, the Jacobian has all these nice properties. And so that means all these linear equations hold on the periods. And then you compare dimensions. If your family is big enough to fill out the linear subspace that you're guaranteed to be contained in because of the special properties of the Jacobian, um, then you're a geo to our orbit closure. The only problem is that this almost never works. It's actually, uh, there are ways of doing heuristics, and all of the heuristics say this should never work. Um, so it's very unlikely. Uh, for the six new orbit closures, the way we did this um, uh, is as follows. So the Riemann surface itself doesn't have much symmetry. Sometimes it has an involution in our example, sometimes it has no symmetry at all. But there's a degree two cover of the Riemann surface that has lots of symmetry. And this is because there's a very special map from our surface, our, our Riemann surface to P1. And you just think about the, the normalization of that map. And so where the surface where you have lots of deck transformations. So all those deck transformations of the degree two cover, they don't descend to give symmetries of the Riemann surface. But they do induce endomorphisms of the Jacobian. And those endomorphisms of the Jacobian do descend. So somehow symmetries of a finite cover can induce endomorphisms of the Jacobian. And this is what Jordan Ellenberg calls endomorphisms of type. type. Um, okay, so uh, this is a picture of a uh, genus 4 surface. All the edges with the same label are identified. And I've given a bunch of linear equations uh, that say a bunch of edges are golden ratio times bigger than a bunch of other. Okay, so this was the, the conjectural form in which one of these orbit closures was first discovered. So this is somehow what we started with. Um, and the conjecture is then that there is 
a, a variety that contains this point and is locally cut out by these equations. Okay, and that's actually somehow very hard to prove. Um, and it, it took us a long time. And I think the reason why is the relevant features of this proof. The most relevant thing is this small degree, very special map to P1. And you can't tell that that exists from this picture. There's simply no indication in this flat geometry that that exists. So somehow, in a sense, we got lucky. And that's, that's almost what made it so hard to figure out what to prove. We got lucky in that you know, we had this miraculous map to P1. There's nothing in the general theory that says this map has to exist. Um, but somehow something even more special than we knew to anticipate exists. And then once we figured out what that is, we were able to, to build this variety. But somehow this picture helped us not at all in the proof. Uh, I would say it, it, this picture hurt us because it tricked me into trying to think about this picture for a long time. Uh, OK. So um, I told you a little bit about one of the, the things, that one of the three results that I mentioned, namely that there are new orbit closures and, and how we build them. Uh, I also told you um, that uh, certain unfoldings of triangles have dense orbit. Um, so the bad news is these unfoldings, um, well, it then turns out they're cyclic covers of P1 branched over three points. So they're the nicest algebraic curves around. They're the nicest Riemann surfaces around. The Jacobians are very, very special. They satisfy every property that you could ask for. And in particular, they look like they should lie in a closed orbit. Um, but we show the orbit of things. And to show that, what we need to do is uh, we show the GL4 orbit leaves the locus where the Jacobian has these endomorphisms. Okay, so there's some sort of locus where the Jacobian is nice and our point sits in it. But the GL2 orbit is actually transverse to it. So we compute this with a first derivative using something called the variational formula for the derivative of the period map. And then there's a whole step after that, because that just shows that uh, there are no conditions, there are no endomorphisms, but then you have to know there are no torsion conditions. And for that, we use a totally different flat geometric inductive approach. Um, so the, this, we use the derivative of the period matrix. Um, and the period matrix is a way of, deco of recording the Hodge decomposition, which is just how you break first homology into the holomorphic one forms and the and the interesting thing about this decomposition is it varies as x changes. Um, so you change the complex structure, and that changes the definition of polymorphic one forms. And that has somehow all the information you could ever dream of. Um, so the period matrix essentially is the matrix whose graph is the space of polymorphic one forms. Um, so the, the last result I mentioned was this finite result with, uh, with Alex Eskin and Simeon Phillips. Um, and to, to show that finiteness result, we um, show that if you have these special properties of the Jacobian that restricts the variation of Hodge function, um, and if, there are, if you had infinitely many orbit closures and they sort of equidistributed to a bigger one, you could sort of pass that specialness of the variation of Hodge structure to the limit. But we were also able to show that the variation of Hodge structure is always as complicated as possible. Um, uh, and we did that, um, uh, when we did that, we actually calculated something called the algebraic called the Kinsage storage co-cycle, which is this mysterious object that's the heart of Teichmuller dynamics that encodes the, the sort of cut and paste equivalence relation uh, on these uh, polygonal presentations. OK, so I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. describing the dogmorphisms of the Jacobian, you were sort of describing it as a real torus, but you have to then choose a complex structure which is invariant under the action. And, and that's the interesting part, right? So an endomorphism of the Jacobian is, the, the way I think about it is, first of all, you take a real linear endomorphism. And that's just, that's just linear algebra that doesn't depend on which complex structure you have on the, the surface. But then it has to be complex linear. And that's where the interesting part lies, exactly. So you would still have pro probably a lot of Flexibility if you did the dynamics of Jacobian as a service, you have Riemann linear relations that would tell you that. You, but if you were just to do this kind of on a billion in the category of abelian varieties instead of Jacobians, then we presumably have a lot more solutions. The rigidity that you see is 
Um, solutions to what? So if you're so if you're if you're if you're taking a particular uh, uh, endomorphism of this real torus and you're you're looking at the various possible complex structures that are invariant that presumably still are, are lots. Yeah, there are lots in the in modulized space of most of them are not Jacobians. Yeah, most of them are not Jacobians. And sure. The difficulty in solving the Schottky problem makes this approach very problematic. I see, so you don't do it directly that way. No, you don't do it directly that way. Somehow the orbit closures are sort of like some sort of unlikely intersection between special subvarieties of AG parameterizing um, abelian varieties of endomorphisms and the Schottky locus. Uh, but it's complicated by the fact you have to keep track of the differential. So it's not actually that, it's something of that flavor. But no, there's been nothing like that that has really been applied. It would be great to really get some traction using that approach, but it just hasn't happened yet. Yes? Did I understand correctly that your curves have a cover to P1 branch over three points? Uh, the unfoldings of triangles, uh, yes, are always cyclic covers of P1 branched over three points. So these are usually defined over number fields. Is that important? Um, uh, it doesn't play a big role so far in this story. But by the way, all orbit closures as algebraic varieties are defined over number fields. And so there's an action of the Galois, the Galois group of Q bar on this, this set of orbit closures. I got loss of the two by two matrix. What is the action of the two by two matrix? Way back to the beginning, you're just changing the uh, the flat structure around. Yeah, you're changing the flat structure. So it's sort of you have these polygons, and you just this act linearly. Okay. Yeah. You take the same combinatorial. Yeah, you keep the same edge identifications. Oh. So all you need to know. So there's a rule that you only identify edges if they're parallel and of the same length. So all you need to know is that when you act by a matrix, edges stay parallel of the same length. So you can keep the same gluing. But why do edges stay the same length? Um, Pairs. You, you want them to, you want to glue them with translations. No, no, why do they? If you just change by an arbitrary matrix. Oh, it's the pairs. You, 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 you know, you have two edges, and you act on them both by the matrix. So then they're, I mean, same, it's the same on parallel lines, right? Yeah. Okay. So it's like I have two copies of the same vector, and I hit them both with the same matrix. So they stay the same. Each segment changes the same. Each segment changes length, but the pair, they, they're the same segment. So they change by the same amount. Uh, the same up to modulo translation, they're the same segment, right? And um, that's, so here, um, these two edges have the same length. And then here, these two edges have the same length. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And I'm not saying this one has the totally same length as what this. The action is, then. Um, what, what is the statement of the action? So you, you get a geo action just by acting on these pictures. So one of these surfaces, but lengths are not that you want to identify don't, don't have to go the same length. They, they do, right? Here, uh, if they start off at the same length, then they still have the same length after the action. It's not that you, it's, it's not a linear map of the plane and parallelogram goes to a parallelogram. Well, I'm thinking scaling, I mean, this horizontal line goes to this horizontal line. A more line. abstract way of saying that, you know, you No, wait, I didn't finish the sentence. This horizontal, this line, this segment goes to a bigger segment. Yes. So, it's 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 not if you have not preserved. It's not no, if you have two true. segments that are the same, they go to two bigger segments that are the same. That's what he's saying. Oh. So, I mean, it, 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 on, on the surface, or at least the surface minus the cone points, you have a flat connection on the tangent bundle, right? This action is really replacing one flat metric with its rescaling. I mean, there are, uh, a flat a flat connection preserves a lot of different uh, different metrics. You can scale it up in any way. That's the, that's where the GL two action is really uh, living. Change the one tangent space and drag it around by the flat connection. Yeah, second speed.